Good to go? Okay, good morning. And welcome to NCCAT's single particle short course. Today we're going to do a little bit of housekeeping, but today's lecture topic is microscopes and tools of the trade. So what we have here, we have a differentiated class where some of the students are coming from the winter course and some specifically for the short course. I'm going to outline what the week ahead will look like. Um, this is also on our webpage. So today we're going to be relatively short in terms of giving you one lecture for the people online as well as people attending the morning sessions about the tools of the trade. During this break, we're going to give a tour for the people who haven't seen NYSBC and they'll be relevant for the short course people later in the afternoon because your practicals will involve sort of getting lost and finding yourself back again in the building. Uh, we have our EM instrumentation spread out as we've deployed them over the course of how NYSBC was built. Tomorrow, moving forward, I think it really begins the fundamentals of single particle. Fred Sigaworth, another one of our curriculum development partners coming from Yale, he has uh, the Principles of Cryo EM webpage up. And he's going to really try to hit you with the foundational math you require. Um, and don't worry, we're going to record that so you can pause, rewind, and look at it again afterwards. And we'll try to steal the slides afterwards, or at least get a copy of them so you can pour over the material. After a break, then Amade is going to tell you a little bit about data analysis. And that starts into the reconstruction workflow. So. We're trying to make today a little bit light to prepare you for tomorrow. Just get ready to sleep well tonight and get ready for a real class. Thursday, we're going to continue on. And Thursday tends to be a very fun day because we have Rich Height and Tom Maltz. And not only that, we have a, a round table at the end. And they'll be talking a little bit more about what do you do now you have a reconstruction? How do you trust what you're getting? If you're feeding garbage in, you get garbage out. But is there anything you can do to limit the garbage in? And if you have something that's a reasonable reconstruction, not to interpret garbage out, even though it is still valid. Okay. That will continue on towards the, the afternoon sessions. And then Friday is something we're going to try to do that is a little bit um, new to both the winter course as well as here in the short course, is the latter part. Up until recently, a lot of people in the EM field only stopped at solving the structure. Now that we've been breaking resolution barriers, we have a model. We can have a near atomic model that we can do something to it, um, or actually have to create that near atomic model. Uh, so, Ali Clark and Gear and Damien will talk about interpretation and trying to extend current EM maps to what people are doing in biology. So that gives you a look ahead on the rest of the week. <clears throat> a couple things to point out. You have all probably know our website by now, nccat.nycpc.org. And I'll make another plug. If you are on Twitter, do follow us at nccatinfo. OK, so let's get into the lecture at hand. And what I'll try to do is try to make it a little bit more interactive, because what's going to happen is it'll be a little bit more lively for the following lectures if the audience is just used to participating and asking questions and involving um, more than just sitting in the lecture style. Plus, uh, so for the keynote, it's fine because you want to actually hear a Nobel Prize winner. But moving forward, a lot of the people coming in, they practice EM day in, day out. They come with a lot of experience, and they can shape their topics towards what interests you the most. And so please do make use of that. But today, let's get into the tools of the trade. So artists have their own medium. Uh, and there's a lot of art in the science that we do. So just like painters have a paintbrush, what we have is electron microscope. In the background, what you see here is one of the early electron microscopes. It was built in the 1930s. So that is uh, Ruska and Noll in the back there putting together one of their electron microscopes. But if you think about that, the technology was created in the early 1900s. Why now, not into the 2000s, was there a big rise in crowd EM, uh, or EM in general? And I'll highlight that 
in the sense that in the past decade, what happened was CryoEM in particular was named the Nature Method of the Year. There was a Nobel Prize in chemistry for CryoEM, and then science in 2018 made microED a runner-up in terms of breakthroughs. So you could say from 1930 to 2014-ish, what really happened? Well, if you think back, well, maybe it just wasn't applied to biology. So when was EM really applied to biology? Well, back in the 70s and 80s, it was applied to biology. And back in the 70s and 80s, we got three angstrom reconstructions. So that sounds really interesting. They had to do 2D arrays, but you know, crystallography, you need crystals. So then why wasn't this quite widely adopted? 2017, something between here and there, something amazing happened. Not only can you solve single particles or single molecule complexes to near atomic resolution, you can do that in a time resolved manner and find several different intermediates. And in, in this particular study, they solved half a dozen reconstructions out of one tube. And the promise really of the future is that what happens if you're not interested in something that's isolated, but you want to look at an in situ context. And that's where EM is headed towards today. But why is it taking so long? What's going on? Because if you think about it, if you want just three action reconstructions, we could have done that back in the 80s. Today, what people really think about EM is they, right now, in, in what I see coming through the center, is they specifically talk about cryo EM and single particle cryo EM. And why that interests them so much is that within the day, they can collect a series of micrographs and process that and get a reconstruction within the same day. And how was that possible? And we'll be talking about a little bit about that throughout the day. In particular, detectors were highlighted. So that's a hardware improvement, meaning better cameras. We have microscopes, and this is, will be the bulk of what we'll be talking about today, different variations of microscopes, but they're more stable. And also the computation. We've shifted uh, to different ways of processing data. And we'll talk about all three of those later in the round table. In addition, we want to make sure it's very easy to use. So how do we make sure that everything is very easy to use? We have software that can utilize not only the detectors, the microscopes, but as well as the processing programs. In great effect, what you can do is some people may have known about these GPCR studies. If you look back and actually analyzed how many micrographs went into that data set, that's around 17,000 images. Software was able to process the 5% that was eventually used in that map. I told you about one study where you can get a half a dozen structures. Now imagine 14. And actually, someone from Dimitri's lab reprocessed that data and was able to pick out, if you move your threshold from three angstroms to four angstroms to now sub 10 angstroms, they picked out over three dozen confirmations from that study. There's distinct confirmations that have been verified as biologically relevant. So the main pathway, so this was a ribosome ge biogenesis pathway. So that was uh, the main branches of the pathway still hold, held true, but they were able to fill in that uh, further gaps. Since then, they've done another study where they made four depletion mutants, and they have 108 separate structures from four different sample sizes. Now, that's amazing because then you're really getting at the heart of the matter. Well, this is just a picture. It's a static picture. True. But if you add kinetics, that static picture actually gives you populations, gives you minor and major pathways, gives you transition states. And you might not have the full movie, but you have a very good model now and a very good pathway model that you can do further biochemistry with. And so what I want to point out is that, yes, we do create pretty pictures at the end of the day, but it's not just about these pictures. It's about the promise of what we can move forward towards in the future, as well as answering biology. 
So if you look at biology, we all are biomedical science scientists in the room here, and you may be interested in a wide variety of samples. And what I want to underscore is I don't mean that just because an electron microscope can go lo very low mag and high mag that this encompasses everything. It's to say that there are many different modalities that can be combined together to really answer your question. And the heart of the matter, again, is you want to answer biological, biological questions and how do we make use of Crowium in that context to ensure that we're pulling together the best information we can to cross-validate and to actually truly answer the question you pose. Certain things that you might notice in this graph that people are interested from atoms all the way to systems level. And you can make use of everything from your eye to other types of single molecule techniques and high resolution techniques. Um, I also, X-ray I'm encompassing things like SACs and other things like that. But what people don't realize is that a lot of AFM studies are also orthogonal and within the same regime range especially when you're looking not just an isolated molecule. Let's say I'm interested in my favorite molecule in the context of an organelle, in the context of a cell, in the context of a tissue, and you want to use the tissue as your specimen. So that's something for the tomography short course, but that's what we're going for. So now I showed you that particular scale range, and there are different types of waves that you can actually use to interrogate biological samples. So some of you may have already seen this information, but why electrons? And now I'm actually really asking the audience a question. Why electrons? What are, what's good and what's bad about electrons? I'll pick on Emily right now. Let's go. <laughs> Okay. Um, do you have any cons about electrons? Uh, the right. This is really good. You all know your stuff. Okay. So, pro small wavelength. We are on the order of picometer wavelength. So, if you think of that, light is on the orders of hundreds of nanometers. I mean, if you're an X ray crystallographer, you don't expect more than a half angstrom resolution. Uh, also, uh, we can actually focus electrons. You can focus other electromagnetic waves, but that is very convenient because if you want to use it in a microscope, you want to be able to change depth of field. You want to be able to focus. Cons, as we said, you can actually damage your sample. There's a lot of energy going through. And also, when your electron beam interacts with the sample, there could be not only energy loss because all the energy is going into your sample, but what happens? It might stop. So there's poor penetration. So there's a lot of different modalities of EM. We're really only focused on single particle, but with a TEM, you can do tomography, single particle, you can do micro ED, 2D arrays. It's a very versatile machine. It depends on how you prepare your sample and how you analyze that sample. But I. I'm talking really a lot about the TEMs. There's other EMs, let's say like this SEM. But our TEM is very similar to an inverted microscope, right, where we need transmission, hence the transmission electron microscope, where we have a source that you go straight through the sample. And then that implies that if you go through your sample, the sample has to be at least electron transparent or thin enough that the beam goes through. Uh, but, yep. So the question is, can you make an X-ray microscope or, or an, an, any other you know, type? You can say it exists already to some extent, but really something like more like the, the EM than the, the EM. Uh, you, you can actually bend X-rays. I, I just don't know if it's in a practical level at this point. Um, 
maybe Christina, have you heard of an X-ray microscope? No, I think the problem is you can't focus it enough. Maybe if we had several football fields, uh, we would then be able to focus. I, I think that's the main thing, lenses. So can you create an X-ray lens that bends it enough? We could stack a whole bunch of undulators together, uh, so, but then I don't know if we have enough magnification um, and then tuning and stability. So if, if you're dedicated enough, you probably could, proof of concept, do that. But the idea is, the issue be of lenses or the issue of, of bending. Wavelength energy. I'm looking at Christina because she's the resident X-ray crystallographer. Yeah. But is there another X-ray crystallographer that I can I can uh, phone a friend with? Yeah, I just like they can be good. It's just that would be like it's in the book work. I don't know if it's a scale thing. Oh, so you can like bend them enough in, the, in a reasonable amount of actual space. So then the. Uh, I'm saying it again because you're not mic'd up. So, so the, the potential answer is you might not bend them enough in the right space. So then the question would be, can you bend them, maintain the energy and the speed, right? If you bend, you might also lose speed. And do you have enough focusing slash magnification power? Because if I do all of that and now I have a 1x microscope and I spend a lot of energy for that, well, then you don't get much magnification. Um, does anyone know the typical magnifications for an electron microscope? Uh, out in the papers, what resolution reconstructions have you been hearing about? Anyone? Three? Okay, so they, two to three? Okay, if you're two to three, what's your minimum pixel size then? 0.8 or one, one angstrom? Okay, so now what's the magnification typically of a microscope. Now, I'll have to give you some help here. A pixel for a detector is on the order of 5 to 14 microns. Right, so you're on the orders of tens of thousands, like 30,000, 40,000, 50,000 X. And that's what we need. So th that's also another consideration when you make a microscope. Can you reach a resolution or a magnification that gives you a resolution that is of interest. And that really well segues into the four parts of an EM that we're going to be talking about today. Your light bulb, as it were, so just like in a light microscope, you have a light bulb. For electron microscope, you have an electron source. Because now we're dealing with electrons, we have to worry about electrons going through whatever medium, and electrons cannot penetrate air very far, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. So we need a vacuum system. Lenses, as, as the topic of discussion we're talking about, so just like light has glass lenses, uh, EM uses actually magnets to bend electrons. And finally, like any good light microscope, you need a detector, and our, detector, our detectors are actually movie cameras in a sense, so hence why I use that icon. So let's go into the different types. So does anyone know the three kinds of electron sources? Anyone uh, have you used the EM before? Yes, okay. Toxin filament, one. Field emission guns, that's another one. And there's another, another type commonly used. Lab six, correct. And funny enough, do you know your light bulbs are also made of tungsten? Why? Well, I gave a little bit of, of an introduction. So, so the light bulbs we have here are also tungsten filaments, and they're. It's, I should have shown a picture, but they're a coil, and then there's another coil. Why? Because when you see this, it has a very high melting point. And the higher the melting point, you can actually have a brighter white light. So you might have done that in your chem lab. And you, like, you oxidize like magnesium, a lot of different things, like fireworks, right? You can create different colors, different wavelengths. But beyond that, 
we have several different electron sources. Tungsten filament is quite cheap. That usually lasts on the order of you know, like a thousand hours, like thousands of hours. It could be last like a month, depending on your use. Something like uh, a crystal, like a lab six, can last a little bit longer than that. And a FEG, a field emission gun, can last on the order of years. So I think right now our service contract on most of our FEG systems cover one tip change a year. Sometimes we've been able to last several years without changing that source. However, on one of our screening microscopes, we change our, our filament, our tungsten filament, maybe two, three times a year. It depends. It depends on usage. It's just like a light bulb. The longer you run the old incandescent light bulb, then, um, then it can actually just eventually wear out. Now, why the difference? So if you think about what's happening, tungsten filament is just a filament. What ends up happening is how do you actually produce electrons from a tungsten filament? There's something, every element has something known as a work function. So you actually have to do work to pull out electrons. So underscored here is a thermionic source. So what actually happens here is we warm up this filament a little bit and we're basically boiling off some electrons. And then we have an anode to, to help send electrons out that way. And by virtue of doing that, a filament eventually will be used up. You're just using up your source and eventually it just goes, same thing. So a failure point is eventually what ends up happening is you, you use up your tungsten and you might see it actually break here and then that breaks that circuit and then you use up that filament and you have to change it. Same thing with the light bulb, right? If you use it up, eventually you get no more light. If you look at it, well, you can shake it. Something's broken down there because you've used up the, the mass there. Um, so here, I mean, you, you heat it up a little bit and then you extract electrons. So you're just sending off electrons here. And then you need a device like a Wenold and you, know, anode, you want to shape it, right? Otherwise, it actually comes out anywhere, right? But you want to shape it directly down your column. So if this was in the microscope, you would flip this 180 degrees. For a crystal, what ends up happening is this is a very good source because what you can do is from a crystal, again, you can send off electrons. Um, but this is a very good source of electrons. There's a little bit more coherency of this. And then you have other sources like FEGs. So what you do here, is, so usually some are like shocky, but you actually heat it up a little bit. Um, also you have cold FEGs that, that are not heated, but what ends up being you have a field here on this tungsten tip, and that actually helps accelerate electrons out. So I'm showing a schematic here. Uh, you can actually go to the Thermo Fisher website and look more about, they talk about uh, shock emission devices, basically the, the types of fegs that are coming out of there. But uh, you can go online as well and get high resolution SEM images of each of these sources and see how they look like. Also, if you're curious, you can go online and see how much they cost. Um, and that will c come into play a little bit later because that impacts these are consumables, right? So you can have certain types of electron microscopes, certain types of sources, and that's a balance between what your use case is and how much it does a cost for that consumable. So th there's a question is I was I was going to do the math, but then I decided, well, let's let's go look look at YouTube. I'm sure someone has done the math. How fast are electrons actually moving? And, and the case really here is, imagine we, we have our thermionic source, we're sending electrons off. What ends up happening is to shape the source, we typically add a bias. You know, uh, if you look, it could be like 4K or 5K, and, th and that's, that's, that's the assist to get electrons to move here. So just within this part, how fast would electrons move? And you can see the velocity uh, is equivalent to the energy per, per coulomb. And we'll make it easy on ourselves and we'll say 5,000 volts or 5 kV. Typically, I think we're closer to 4 kV. And, you know, long story short, you get, you know, 
0.5 keV, and then you convert that to SI units, you get something in joules, and you need the mass of an electron, and then you break out your calculator, and you finally do it, and you get that speed. And what does that actually mean? That's roughly 14% the speed of light. So you're, you're only going 5 keV, and you're already going 14% already going the speed of light. Now, what happens if you're at 200 kV? Does anyone know how fast you're going at 200 kV or 300 kV? Half the speed of light to three quarters the speed of light, or maybe like uh, two thirds the speed of light, rather. When do you have to start worrying about relativity? I think when you, when you start getting closer to like 0.7 the speed of light, you can, uh, physicists can double check me. I, you have to fact check that. But, uh, that's pretty fast. And that's not the highest KV microscope. So something that we just touched upon was just electron sources. Something I'm segueing into would be different types of EMs. And a lot of things factor into what do you put in there. I always make the analogy to a car where if you ever bought a light microscope, it's like buying an electron microscope because everything is actually modular. So, but if I were to buy a car, it would be like, okay, now I want wheels, now I want a steering wheel, now I want an engine. Oh, you want seats? Well, you just have to add on that. That's all a la carte and all configurable. And like that, it will depend. Um, there is a very good analogy, again, with cars would be Formula One car, very high performing. Do you think every race is the same car? No. Basically, at the end of each race, they rebuild the whole thing. So there's something to be said about when you have a very, very high performing cutting edge instrument. It requires a lot of maintenance and it might break down. So you don't want to get the experimental prototype, you want to get something a little bit more stable. So now let's get a Honda Civic or a Toyota Camry. Oh, I'm not going to be able to make my laps in time, right? But it'll be great to go to the grocery store, it'll be great to drive in the city. There are a lot of parts, so it'll be a little bit cheaper to service. So just like that analogy, that's why I'm making here, that it's a little bit cute to say there, there's actually a lot of these out in the wild where they make Lego versions of microscopes. And just like Legos, you can piece together different parts to make a microscope. But in real life, you can do that too. You can piece together different parts. Like you want face plates, add that on. You want a probe corrector and CS corrector, add that on. Just add a million dollars per request. <laughs> um, so, but that, seriously, um, I'm already uh, beating you. I was going to ask people what type of microscopes and what type of KVs, but I already have it on the slide, so you can't unsee what you've already seen. But maybe I can flip it the other way. How many people here have used something on the order of 80 to 100 KV? You can raise your hand. Wow, a lot of you. So that must be the workhorse, and that was always intended. How about 200 KV? Okay, a little bit less of you, and then 300 kV. Okay, so that is typical, that sort of slice where almost everyone raised their hand for this, half, and then maybe a quarter raised their hand for that. Now, the electron source is one thing. The next would be your high tension stack. So if your electron, so here's a schematic of a microscope. If your electron source is here, you have an accelerator that accelerates, so you, typically that goes all the way to ground, your electrons. And on an 80 to 120 kV microscope, you have a tungsten filament or a lab six. That's really great, you can, you can get high contrast. You may get sub nanometer resolution, but people tend not to get near atomic resolution uh, with this type of microscope. So examples are the 1230 and a T12. Um, they also have uh, a Talos L120 in that class. Um, and you might also, in, in the Joules, you might have like a 1400. So these are all just different manufacturers, different types of microscopes that are crowd capable. And you primarily use this for screening. So has anyone used this for data collection? Negative stain data collection? You can, you can do negative, okay. So, uh, of the people who raised their hand, have you done a reconstruction from your negative stain? So that's like a half. So, so that, that's a sort of a dying art where back in the day when we didn't have such sophisticated detectors, what we were doing is we were creating initial models in negative stain. 
because of the signal to noise and the the problem where we don't have handedness and so what you can also do is you can take a tomogram or you can do uh, two tilts the reason being is that if you're dealing with a room temperature negative stain sample it's a le less electron sensitive and you can take more than one image for our crow samples one image and you're pretty much done because you already cooked your sample so something that's been really amazing uh, so I uh, sort of talked about it earlier that you can actually go to 100 kV with a FIG and get a balance between a higher class of instrument. It's like putting an overpowered engine into a car. And you can actually do a lot more than just screening. You can attempt to get initial models going. But a lot of people right now have been looking at this class, this 200 kV microscope, because if you add it into a very, very good environment, what you can do is you can get two plus angstrom resolution. So that's in Antarctica. But what that allows you to do is it, it gets you beyond this range of three and a half to four to something that's quite respectable as a data collection microscope. So how many people know that on a 200 kV microscope you can get sub three? How many of the people didn't raise their hand? Did you know that was possible? Um, and the question is, why not more? And that's going to be an open question. Now, the microscope that a lot of people are really using for the one and a half to three angstrom resolution range is a 300 kV microscope. And there are many different versions of that. And almost all of them are always a field emission gun. So what's the advantage of one versus the other? Well. It really depends on your use case, and it also depends on your sample. Because ideally, we would say, work 10 lifetimes on the sample until it's the best, and then come back. But that's un unfortunate, because I don't live 10 lifetimes. I only live one. And I might not eat, spend that full lifetime just on this one project. So you may ha might have to make do with a suboptimal sample, because that's the best we can do. That's the best the technology can do and how can you extract the most information from that sample. Now, it's not to say that you can't do it uh, on a lower tier microscope, but as my car analogy, for example, if you get the, the luxury model, leather seats are included, they're actually heated, you know, you get you know, a nice warranty, and you have a lot of extras. So what ended up happening in the early days, we used to not only have nitrogen cooled microscopes, but helium cooled microscopes. So what ended up happening was the inner vessel was helium, and the outer vessel was nitrogen to cool the helium. Why helium? Why not use nitrogen? So it's supposedly cooler, and that way it would the thought was it would mitigate the interaction of the electron beam with your sample such that you would have a more stable type of instrument. Concurrent with those helium microscopes, they actually had better goniometers, such that if you cooled those helium microscopes just with nitrogen, they performed a little bit better than the counterpart that wasn't the helium version. So what I'm trying to underscore is that it's not one part, it's all the parts entirely together that really help make a microscope more stable and then more useful for what we want to do. What's the highest KV microscope you've heard of? Five fifty KV? I think it's one of the tight ones. One thousand? How about three thousand? <laughs> um, there is a one thousand. There there's a couple. There's one in Albany, there there's a Hitachi there's the Hitachi and Joel in Japan. And I don't know if this is fully built yet, but I think it is, but this is a three megavolt. So, interestingly enough, I was looking on the webpage, what is their electron source? Lab 6. <laughs> so is FEGO is the best case? Okay. Now, what is the advantage of this? So I didn't really talk about um, the transmission part of electron microscope. Does anyone have an idea what the free mean path 
of an electron microscope is? First of all, do you understand what I mean by free mean path, the, the path that the electron can go through? Anything? Any inkling? It's on the order of, you know, a couple hundred nanometers to maybe half a micron, depending on the type of microscope that we use. So on my previous slide, that's the range that is acceptable or that you would expect. Now, I said that for the 100 to 300 kV, you can go hundreds of nanometers to maybe up to half a micron. That means that's, that's the thickness of a sample that actually would be in focus or it can be projected out from one of those electron microscopes. Now, extend that thought process. What about these microscopes? How thick of a sample do you think you can put in one of these microscopes? Okay, let's, let's do a show of hands. Tens of nanometers, hundreds of nanometers, microns, microns. It's actually microns. However, the beam is extremely bright, so this is not typically for a biological sample. It can be, uh, but you'll get low resolution because you're basically cooking your sample as it goes through. But you can do things like, I want to go through um, an airplane wing because there's been a stress fracture, and I want to analyze that, not just by SEM. I can want to take a tomogram, and they can go through micron level slices. And because it's a material, instead of a biological sample, you can up your dose. Yep. Uh, at, at any one given time, there's really only about an electron or so in the column at any one time. It's just that we take exposures over a period of time. So you can take a very quick exposure, or you can, you can dim the beam. Yes, you can. Uh, what matters then would be, the last topic would be, does your detector detect signal over the noise? So there are two different considerations, what dose is hitting your sample, then what dose can you detect by your detector? And that might not be the same range because you might preserve your sample, but then your detector detects nothing. Your detector might detect something, but then your sample is cooked. So that's a balance. And when you say dim the beam, um, what do you mean exactly? So just, you can, just like in a light bulb, you can change the illumination, you know, like, like this and this. I mean, you, can, you can do that on the microscope. You can, you, can, you can actually send more or less electrons, the electron flux at any given time can be tuned. Well, in if if so, the question is, how do you change the the illumination? So, in in your gun, you, what well, you have to what you call spot size, and so then that means how much you you focus the beam. So then you could have a probe that's very tight and that's bright, or or very large and that's a little bit dimmer because by the time it gets in. In addition, you can put apertures and other things to, to change how much flux you have going, not only hitting your sample, but actually going into your detector. So then a compromise between damage and resolution is 300 maybe? The question is, is 300 kV a compromise between dose and resolution? Uh, it is a compromise. It, it might not be the most optimal compromise, but it's also a compromise due to other factors, uh, other factors being our lenses. So a lot, so for example, if you have a Titan Creus, it is designed to operate its best at 300 kV. Not to say that you cannot run it at 200 or 100, but it was designed for 300. So let's say I have my car, it's designed to drive on the road. It's not that I can't drive on a mountain, not that I can't drive on a beach, but you lose performance from there. And, but, if you but if your biological question is within tolerance, uh, then you can, you can use it. Typically, if you're doing tomography and you're in the nanometer range, uh, you can get away with a lot. I mean, you can go with thicker samples than you can think of. You can go with uh, less dose. You can go with lower mags to get a higher field of view. Uh, so there are compromises in that. So is 300 kV the best compromise? It might not be, depending on what your sample is. Like 
will we expect to have a higher KV microscope in the future? Unlikely, due to price point, there's been a greater push for a lower KV because of the co cost of building and maintenance. Um, there has been a lot going into the R&D design, but we could have a higher KV microscope. I believe the technology is out there. It's just that we don't have them. We, we need uh, a market demand for a particular type of science. We've been talking about dose and resolution. Does anyone know the dose range that's acceptable for a biological sample, a crow specimen, before we start losing side chain information? Sure, someone knows this answer. Okay, so so one uh, suggestion was the 70 electrons per angstrom squared for the entire dose. By then, you are losing quaternary structure. So, so how do we get around it? So, what our movies tend to be on the order of 30 to 100. If you're taking tomograms, up to 200 electrons per angstrom squared. We do post processing to downweight later frames and minimize that. But typically, by then, we're already affecting quaternary structure. Up to what degree depends on your sample, how electron sensitive it is. Uh, usually within the first, uh, so back in the day, before we were taking movies, it used to be um, per 100 keV, you would do 10 eV electrons per angstrom squared. So, you would try to keep your doses on a screening microscope to 10 electrons, 200, 220, and then 30 at 300. Then we got a, a, a camera that, that can take movies and we can actually shape the data. Why? Because really within the first couple electrons, your side chains are gone. Within you know, a dozen or so electrons, you're already impacting secondary structure. And you know, beyond that, your tertiary structure for your movie, and then you're already impinging on quaternary structure. That doesn't mean that 70 electrons per angstrom squared movies are useless, as you said. It's because we are able to do better post-processing to use different frequencies of information over the course of that movie. Okay, so on this topic also, we have an electron going through, why do we need a vacuum? What happens if we have a light bulb without a vacuum? So if I just like burst the vacuum and turn on one of these lights, what will happen? Filament goes. But there are other reasons why we need a vacuum. So beyond the filament just going, uh, what can happen is if you have gas in your column and you have electron beam, you can actually deposit that onto your sample. Right? Your electron beam can take it and put it down onto your sample and then you can build up contamination. Also, I was alluding to this, at standard temperatures and pressure, if we had a nice electron beam, it probably could go on the order of a centimeter in air before all the energy is dissipated. I mean, it just it heats up and everything because there's a lot of molecules. So a vacuum is very important. Also, um, what ends up happening, if you have a lot of electron current in air, there are a lot of ions that can conduct. So what you could do is you could also have arcing. So imagine you're going 300,000 volts to ground, and you have a lot of ions there. Most likely, the electron won't experience that full field. Something's going to dissipate that energy. And uh, the accelerator stack up here that goes from 300,000 to ground, you'll probably short it out. So we need a vacuum. What type of vacuums are there? Does anyone know the type of vacuum pumps? Some of you should. I'm looking around because some of you have used a microscope before. Do you know? What, what name one type of vacuum pump if you know? Ion getter pump is one. That's, that's one of the best vacuums. Just any vacuum. Have, have anyone heard of vacuums? What type of vacuums? Turbo pump. Turbo pump, turbo molecular pump. There are actually a couple other types of pumps. What pumps a turbo pump? Because a turbo pump can't just run on its own. 
be a pre-vacuum pump, oil diffusion pump, diaphragm pump. So we have things like rotary pump, diffusion pumps, turbo pumps, and IGP. So it seems like a lot of people know the high end. There is also support vacuums for that. And here gives you a picture of the pressures. Typically, an IGP, you can go 10 to the minus 9, 10 to the minus 12 tour. Imagine going to the International Space Station and heading outside. That's sort of the vacuum you're experiencing. But imagine having that pump pump air. That pump's going to fail really soon because it'll saturate. An iron getter pump actually has a material called like a getter material that soaks up ions. So you usually send, you know, 1,000 to 8,000 volts anywhere on that end, and basically an ion goes here and gets trapped in that getter material. And that's how it, it works. That's going to saturate really quickly. So what usually happens is you have pre-vacuum pump pumping, maybe a diffusion pump, pumping a turbo pump, or maybe a rotary pump pumping a turbo pump that then is pumping an IGP, such that uh, this pump doesn't turn on until the turbo pump is in this range. The turbo pump doesn't turn on until one of these pumps pump into that range. Anyone know how fast a turbo pump can rotate? Turbo pump is just like a turbine that circles around. How many thousands of, it's on the order of tens of thousands of RPMs. Could be 50,000 RPMs, depending on your turbo pump. So now let's flip to the microscope. So we have a gun here, we have a specimen here, and we have a chamber and camera here. So this is a screenshot of, I don't know if that's the T12 or F20, uh, but it's a Tech9 series. What ends up happening is we have a very good vacuum up here, and the vacuum is lower by the time we get here. And what's in the microscope are differential apertures, such that we can maintain the different vacuums in the area. And, and there's a lot of IGPs locally pumping here the gun, and we're on 10 to minus tor 9 tour. But then in the specimen, we're a little bit lower. And then finally, the chamber and camera were lower still. Right? And that's by need. Can we pump the whole microscope better? Yes, it would cost more. It would wear out more. So we would only try to reach the vacuum ranges, which is necessary. So I Avoiding this, but here is a picture of a Krios. This is an autoloader system. If you take the top off and you take the, this plate off and you look in, this is actually where the sample is held. This is where the electron beam goes. So you might have seen a big electron microscope, but from here to here, that is not really the beam path. The column, that little dot. It's like if you had a pencil, like the graphite like piece of that pencil is really all you need in terms of space for an electron beam to head through. So why all the shielding? We actually, in electron sources, do kick out x-rays. We do have quite a bit of energy. So there is lead, and also a lot of this is taken up by lenses and other material like to cool down the microscope. So we talked about lenses. I see that we only have 10 minutes, so I'll, I'll start hurrying up here. Um, so it's about our electron lenses, our lenses are magnets. So if you remember the right-hand rule, an electron beam going through a magnet, it actually rotates. So something that people don't realize is that you can use lenses to focus, to magnify, but because our lenses are magnets, there's a rotation. If you looked at an electron microscope, you'll know that you do not have a continuous mag range. You could, but what will end up happening is as you're changing your mag, your image will rotate. So typically, most manufacturers have defined magnifications such that the image goes back to where it was more or less. Otherwise, it will be quite confusing to try to track something. Something else that we can also have lenses, we can have additional magnets like stigmators that can impact the beam. And later today, some of you will see a CS-corrected microscope that has a hexapole that can 
distort the beam in a way to make it more coherent, meaning the beams are more parallel. So what could happen with lenses? You could have stigmation, meaning you have a nice circle that becomes more like a football, right? And then you could have stigmators to shape it back to a perfect circle, more or less. Also, you could have higher order aberrations that you're not accounting for that lenses can then correct for. So then that leads us to a question, what do you want to do with a microscope? There's been a rallying cry that you don't want to align your microscope once it's been aligned. Because you could be misaligning your microscope while trying to align it. A microscope, as I said, has a lot of magnets. And the resistivity of a magnet changes upon temperature change. So let's say you're in a room with an unstable environment then what could happen, your lenses go off. So therefore, if you want to align a microscope, you have to be very careful in making sure that you're aligning it appropriately in the right area. You want something that's at eucentric height and focus. You want to check the microscope, because if it's already aligned, then you don't want to misalign it. You just want to touch it up. And you want to align from the top to the bottom, meaning from the source, your condenser lenses, your objective lenses, then your projection lenses, and down forward. So there's several sets of lenses. Uh, a TEM is a compound microscope. There are certain things also that you can put in, like an aperture. And you can have uh, the Fresnel fringes here, because what ends up happening is when you have crossovers, your aperture might not be at your back focal plane or crossover. And when you have light going through an aperture, you can have additional aberrations like this. So if you move this aperture, uh, well, one way of getting uh, minimizing this is moving your aperture to the back focal plane, and you won't see as many of these fringes. So just a caution, uh, temperature is very important. And if you're doing any alignments, make sure there's a way to undo, because if there's only one way forward, and you mess up, then you have to keep on going all the way back. OK, last topic in the last few minutes, cameras. So there are many different cameras. Just like in your cell phone, you have something that takes photons and, and captures it. And then there's other cameras that uh, can actually directly detect electrons and how a photon detector works is that an electron hits a phosphor screen, kicks out photons, and there is a fiber optic plate that then reads it. And uh, that's also known as a CCD, a charge coupled device. You could have something that's direct sensing, which is a CMOS camera, for example, that instead of going through a phosphor screen and kicking out light, it just can directly detect um, the electron beam. And that's what's known as one of these direct detectors. You can have a photon detector that's a CMOS. Uh, and typically, for example, you can run a direct detector in something known as counting mode or integrated mode. And you need a higher dose, but that's a, a integrated image and just it is an image. Right now, I have not heard of any direct sensing CCDs. Probably a direct sensing CCD would be good for one shot, and then you just blow out your CCD. It would just be as good as using film. Something that people throw out a lot when they're characterizing detectors is the MTF, which is relative to your point spread function, and the DQE, which is your quantum efficiency. So how much signal can you get per noise? If you look at different cameras, then you can see different envelopes of this is Nyquist frequency from uh, going out, and this is uh, relative amplitude, how much signal that you can get. And what ends up happening is when you have different types of cameras and different modes, whether you're just taking an integrated image or you're taking it in the mode where you reduce the dose and you're trying to capture individual electron hits, hence you're trying to do electron counting, the performance of the camera changes. 
And there are many different cameras out there from the Catan to Direct Electron, Thermo Fisher, uh, even Dectris has a camera. And then you can see that also your KV matters. So depending on your KV, as well as uh, the type of camera you have, your quantum efficiency changes. So then what is the bar? Uh, this line bar is probably film. And the idea is that there's certain compromises. What you want to do is you want to have the best detector possible, but you don't want to waste time. So in counting mode, counting mode can be anywhere between two to 10 to three times slower than an integrated image. But an integrated image may give you more quantum efficiency across all the frequencies. Okay. It also depends on the sensor. And we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more maybe in the afternoon for those in the short course because we'll have some more time on a particular microscope. So I'm going to start winding down here because I think I have uh, until 1045 and I don't want to keep you too far over. But in lieu of a classical break, what I'm going to do for the remainder would be actually walk people through. If you've already seen the facility, by all means, we'll see you tomorrow for a very math heavy. Uh, so get, get ready, get in that mindset, you know, remember your calculus. Uh, but otherwise, for the, the people who haven't seen the facility, I'm going to take you around and it'll be quite relevant because in the afternoon for the short course, we're going to have practicals at some of these different locations. At NYSBC, we have several different centers. By the end of the year, we'll have seven Creos instruments. Three of them are G2 Titan Creos instruments. Three of them are G3 Titan Creos instruments. And the seventh one is a G4. What does that mean? Generation two, three, and four. And there's just like your iPhone, it just, there's, there's different things in each generation. In terms of our screening microscopes, uh, so these are all at 300 kV. In terms of our screening microscopes, we have a couple at 120 kV, a Joel 1230 and a Tech9. And at 200 kV, we have a FEG F20. Uh, we also have other microscopes. Our Glacius was just finished uh, yesterday, so you'll be able to see that we have an additional uh, FEG microscope at 200 kV. And some of you have seen not this device, but the experimental prototype of that. But that will help pitch and give you, we'll continue the discussion more about the microscopes that we actually use. And then later, uh, right after the tour, we'll begin a round table where we're gonna talk more about if we were to build a facility, what do you choose? <coughs> Let's say you're playing the game of Monopoly, what properties are you gonna get? Like, are you gonna build a hotel or not? Like, so that actually impacts uh, what you're trying to achieve. So I'll close here to try to keep on time. Does anyone have any questions? Otherwise, we'll go for a tour, and I'll try to point out a few things, and that'll help jumpstart what's going to happen right after for the short course participants, is we're going to do a round table on facility building. And if you were to design a facility, whether that's hardware, software, or people, how do you do that? And we'll do that as a point of contrast by initially showing you what we have here. So you can leave your stuff here or